have the pleasure of speaking with Terry Lynch and Peter Clausey on a very uh, topical subject, predatory short selling. Terry, let's start with you. Define what it is predatory short selling is to you. So we're not against short selling. So what is short selling? Short selling is when you bet against the security. You think it's going to go down and you say, I sold the stock short and you're looking to cover in the future, hopefully at a lower price and make a profit. So that's com completely legitimate and we're not against that. What we're against is when you don't declare a short sale and you sell a stock with the hope that it goes down, <clears throat> you haven't declared it short and you never declare it short and you just keep on selling because this is what happens. And eventually it does selling to get selling and it drives the price down and then you cover that's predatory short selling so it's non-disclosed short sales and of course peter i'm certain you have a couple of two cents to add to that do you agree with that definition of predatory short selling i do but i would expand it a bit to include times when a company stock is fragile and some idiots looking just to kick the shit out of him when he's down and i find that offensive when people use short selling as a means of settling personal petty uh, revenge matters. Compliance question. Of course, you're a compliance ex expert, Peter. Are there any compliance regulations that you can speak to on this topic? Well, the big one is disclosure. You know, I've talked about this before. So like, like with conflicts of interest, conflicts of interest don't kill. Undisclosed conflicts of interest kill. And it's the same thing with short selling. It's like the guys in British Columbia who don't register with SETI and yet they feel free to trade all day. And the Securities Commission's response is, eh, they didn't hurt anyone. It's the disclosure that's need, that needs to be made. Yeah, tr transparency is the key. I think Peter's absolutely right about that. And, and there's appalling lack of transparency in our capital markets today. And, and you know, people are pulling out. You know, you're seeing, uh, as Eric Sprott said uh, to me one time, we were in an interview on this topic, he said, uh, investors aren't stupid. You know, they figure out a rigged game and they get out of it. And that's where we're at. And we're not, this isn't just limited to mining. This is no. the junior tech game, the junior oil and gas. It, and not just in Canada either. This is a pervasive problem. It, it's been a problem around the world since they put in, uh, basically, I, I believe algorithm trading was a, set, a checkered flag for this whole thing. Yep. Uh, I interviewed a guy by the name of Wes Christian. He's uh He's a lawyer in the States, probably the top litigator in the space. He's won, I think, 10 or 11 uh, lawsuits in the 10, uh, 11 figure, like, you know, 10 to 60 million, I've heard in, in settlements from Goldman Sachs and and the like, you know, the big investment banks on. And and basically, he, he, he feels it's probably every company's got 20 to 30 percent short in America. Wow. Period. That's a big number. Yes. When I, he, he says it's trillions of dollars. He said if you were selling, uh, you know, he, he uses an example of about uh, truck, uh, you know, um, permits, <laughs> and like printing truck permits and selling them out the side door. Well, they'd take you off to jail, but they do this every day in the market and nobody's going to jail. And a large part of this is uh, what's the complaint in the silver market about why the silver price is more abundant, undisclosed, yeah. undisclosed funny trading. Yep. Gentlemen, I'm going to pull you back again. Predatory, short selling, finding a good definition online is almost impossible. Who gets to decide what's predatory and what's not? Terry, I'm going to throw this back at you again so you can dumb this down because many people out there are not even aware that this exists. So I, I think to keep it simple, it, it, if you sell a stock, and you and you with your, with an with an intention for it to go down and for you to cover it. If you don't declare it as a short sale, then that's predatory. Whatever your motivation, if you don't declare it's a short sale when you have, don't own the stock and you sell it, that's a predatory act action against uh, the market. And that's I would say is the definition. I disagree with you a little bit. The first sale, which is undisclosed, is illegal. The second sale is predatory because it's piling onto the first, which has not been disclosed. The first one is merely illegal. Okay, so Peter, if I understand, uh, we're now disagreeing on if it's a little evil or a lot evil, is that correct? Different kinds of evil. The first sale is illegal if it's not disclosed. The second sale is predatory because it's piling onto the first illegal sale. Peter, I rarely see any news 
stories covering this type of issue and someone actually being fined. Am I just missing something? Where do I find this information? I've made many complaints to regulators over the years, as you know. And the response I often get back is, we're not going to tell you if we're investigating. Or I get an off the record phone call with, it's just too much resources for us and he's just going to appeal anyways. So we're just going to continue to chase the broker who printed a pink ticket instead of a blue by mistake, because he's easy. So no, there are no cases out there. There, there, there is actually in, in the US a number of cases. And, and the, but you know, what's interesting is you'll get like Wed Bush or whatever that brokerage firm was called. Uh, they'll be fined, you know, six or seven million dollars for $70 billion worth of transactions. I mean, it's a rounding year. So what happens, you'll get like a significant seven figure fine and you think, oh, wow, you know, they'll announce $3 million fine to, you know, XYZ brokerage firm. You think, well, that's pretty significant, but it's on billions in trading. So it's a fraction. It's, it's, a, it's a cost of doing business. I don't know of any in Canada. Yeah, I don't know of any in Canada either. They, IROC is uh, not, uh, not too active in that area, that's for sure. But the US, they, they typically find them, but it's, it's a cost of business for the brokerages and they just move on to the next victim. Terry, you have created uh, a formula to help deal with the problem. You've created uh, Save Canadian Mining. Would you not be putting together or uh, a formula to catch this or provide some kind of repercussions or what what is happening with uh, Save Canadian Mining? Because, you know, we all want to yeah. support you. We just want to understand what sure. we're supporting. Well, you know, what we, we, what we started off to try and do, what we thought would be the best and easiest sort of simplification to, to solve the problem was to reinstate the tick test. So before 2012, around the world, there was a tick test before you could short a stock. So in other words, stocks had to be going up before you could short them. So that naturally, you know, sort of acted as sort of a, it, that, that meant most stocks didn't get shorted. And the reality is, well, that was because generally speaking, exchanges were to allow companies to raise capital and allow investors to have multiple opportunities. But when they allowed algorithms of trading to come in, remember the promise of algorithm trading was, it's gonna enhance liquidity, it's gonna reduce friction, reduce commissions, and, 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 and our institutional, you know, our pension funds and our mutual funds will be able to get better returns for our investors because of this reduced friction. That's just a fantasy. You know, the reality is, you know, the, the, the smart guys, the really smart guys in the room <laughs> figured this stuff out early on. And now they got these algo bots out there that looks at your, your bid and ask across multiple exchanges that only a computer could do and sees who's weak and who's strong. And they pound your, your symbol down because they got unlimited capital. And that's what happens. And so you see very inefficient capital markets. Capital markets, you know, I, I mean, in mining, it's super simple because, you know, we're easy. We, 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 we have to raise capital to do our drill programs. And it's sort of back in the day, you know, when, you know, when Ned Goodman was, was funding mining companies and, and Frank Mercer was funding mining companies, uh, you would go to them with a concept and they would say, yeah, okay, we believe in it. We'll give you so much capital. And they would call us other investors. You, you'd go and you'd execute. If you drilled successfully, your stock went up. If, if it didn't, wasn't successfully, your stock went down. That was capitalism. That's what made Canada the mining capital of the world. That no longer happens. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the tragedy of it all. Okay, so Peter, reinstating the tick test. Do you have any idea how we might make that happen? Well, that, that's just the Canadian Securities Administrators uh, across Canada getting together with Quebec and implementing a rule. That's actually not that difficult. But there's more to it than that. The various securities commissions have to actually prosecute people, not just on this, but on other things. Yeah. They have to be built up as regulators to be afraid of, like the SEC. In Canada, they need to be given better power, better investigative power. Uh, the SEC could walk in and arrest you. No Securities Commission in Canada can do that. So we need to toughen the teeth in the right ways and not in knee-jerk reaction like 43101, which is largely a waste of time and paper, give the commissions real teeth to go get the bad guys. Well, on yeah. that note, <laughs> I'd like to encourage both of you to come on Investor Intel to discuss other compliance issues. You, Terry, on behalf of Save Canadian Mining, of course, Peter, as our top compliance expert in Canada. Thank you both for joining us today. 
Great, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.